Okay, I think we're good to go. So welcome, um, Diane, uh, and welcome everybody out there. We've had a great response um, and people still flooding in at the moment, which is fantastic um, to see. Um, welcome to the first and hopefully many um, live broadcasts um, uh, coined the Master Series, meeting the, the whiskey makers across our business. Uh, my name is Todd Bradbury. I'm uh, the head of rare and collectible whiskies at Just Three and Brooks. And we have Diane over on Sky. Um, what we'll do in a couple of minutes is just explain the format very quickly. Um, if you do want to reach out to us and ask any questions, there should be a Q&A feature down in the bottom middle part of your screen. Um, and please feel free to ask any questions you want. I'm not promising that Diane and I are going to answer them. Uh, but we will try and tackle as many as we can through the next kind of 45 minutes or so. Um, and I really want to focus on three things which are quite important to me and I think Diane as well. Um, we're going to hear more about Diane, her role and Sky um, and the mighty Talisker Distillery. Um, we're going to focus in on three whiskies which were available on the mailer. Um, don't worry if you don't have those three whiskies, they are still available to buy. Um, log on to justarinis.com. We are still successfully sending out safe parcels of wine and spirits to key connoisseurs and collectors. Um, please check out any of the details online after this. Reach out to me personally if you have my details. Um, and the last and uh, uh, another interesting thing is we'll talk about distillation technique. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why Talisker is quite unique. Um, and we'll hopefully whisk you through the whiskies um, so that you can try it. As I've mentioned before, it doesn't matter if you have a Talisker in front of you, grab yourself a whiskey and a glass of water. Hopefully it is a Talisker. Um, but without further ado, um, I just want to introduce Diane. Do you want to say a quick hello uh, and what you do, Diane? Sure, so you've already said it, but I'm Diane Farrell. I'm the Senior Site Manager here at Talisker on the beautiful but very remote Isle of Skye. So it's my responsibility, my job to oversee the running of both the production and also of the visitor centre where I am today. Great and we noticed that you're inside the visitor centre rather than outside and looking at the Coolin Mountains, why is that? Uh, because it's a wild of sky and it's definitely wild today and you can't even see the Coolins. Um, I actually just seen a quote on the wall over there that says to live on sky you need to be and there's a whole list of things and one of them says waterproof and I can definitely attest back to that. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. So I guess that leads me into my kind of first official question. You know, what drew you to Sky and ultimately Talisker Distillery? So since leaving university and joining Diageo, I've always been extremely passionate about our brands. And Talisker, as you all know, is loved by consumers all across the world. Mm -hmm. And it's such a powerful and well-known brand that actually when the job became available, I actually almost applied for the job right the way through to press and submit without even contacting my partner to let him know I was doing it, which is probably a good thing to do, seeing it's quite, it's quite a far away place. Um, but luckily he supported me. Um, and also the first time that I actually visited Sky and Talisker was after I had applied. So the brand speaks volumes actually, I was willing to apply for the job without even ever coming here. Um, and really for me, it's just been part of Talisker's history and it's something I'm very proud of. Good stuff. So in terms of, you know, the mighty Talisker, what, what do you think kind of sets it apart from our other 28 distilleries? That one's easy for me. I think it's our incredible location. So made by the sea, it's in our name, the cool and hills in the background, the coastal, the rugged landscape. Um, for me, the liquid is so representative of place. So actually, no matter where you are in the world, you take one sip and you're transported here. You could be by, you know, a campfire, by a bonfire, um, drinking your, your dram of Talisker and looking out over the Coolins. Um, and I think that that's what makes it really special. And luckily for me, I live here. So I'm able to look at the same view as the distillery and appreciate a dram looking over that view. Um, but no matter where I am in the world, it's the same. So I could take one step and I'm transported right back here. And I think that's really special. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually have to admit that the first time I tried Talisker, it was not on my top pick list, to be honest. But I was young and I don't think my palate was very accustomed to trying that style of whiskey. So actually, we'll talk about that robust spirit and we'll talk about, you know, uh, that different style throughout, uh, throughout today and um, throughout the next hour or so. But, 
you know, what might be really interesting, certainly for myself and for hopefully people on the call, is a little bit about the history. So is there anything within the history that you feel is, is an important kind of thing to highlight for uh, Talisker Distillery? Yeah, I'll take you on a, a whistle stop history tour. Um, so Talisker was founded by two brothers, so Hugh and Kenneth McCaskill, and that was back in 1830. So the brothers were classic clearance landlords. Um, they moved to Skye in 1825. And as well as being sheep farmers, they decided to try their hand at distilling. So their venture into whiskey making turned out to be unsuccessful and the bank took over Talisker in 1848. And then after that, a number of owners tried to keep it going. Um, and I think that it was so tough for them due to the sheer remoteness of where we are to keep it all up and running, especially without the pier and the bridge that we have today. Um, so luckily, um, Roderick Kemp and Alexander Allen bought over the distillery in 1880. And when they did that, they expanded the site to include a distillery pier. And that was around the early 1900s. But up until this point, all of the casks, they were lashed together and they were floated out to the loch to be pulled, pulled onto the waiting puffer boats, um, waiting offshore for them, which is quite an interesting fact, I think. Yeah. Um, another interesting one actually for me is in 1908 um, a local schoolmaster found a sea snake and he put it into it was one of the, in one of the cooling tanks at Talisker and he put it into a bottle with Talisker spirit and that bottle is still in my office to this day under lock and key because that's quite terrifying <laughs> but I think that's quite amazing that it's lasted since 1908 and it's still here on site today. Um, and lastly, in 1916, a consortium, uh, including John Walker and Sons and John Dewar and Sons, took control and Talisker has remained in that group until today, which most people will know as the Agio. Yeah, it's really cool. And actually those three you know, stories, that if I could pick three bits of information out and build on that, um, I remember hearing the stories of the McCaskill brothers rowing out in a rowing boat and essentially just pointing to an area where they would build a distillery. And even in today's kind of uh, rugged coastline of Skye, um, you wouldn't even dream about building a distillery on there. Uh, you know, very, very complex operation to kind of build a distillery. So there's no wonder that they didn't really exceed, uh, you know, succeed first time round actually. And, you know, I, I do love the story about them and hearing about them because they were rogues, you know, essentially clearing their lands um, and replacing people with sheep, which is wonderful story as well. Um, but you know the, the the fascinating thing for me is is still up until that 1900s is floating the barrels, um, you know, out to to the puffer ships. I mean, it's quite quite fascinating, really. Um, and and clearly, 95 I think was when the the, the bridge to Sky um, allowed it to be more slightly more accessible. Still a kind of four and a bit odd hour slot from kind of Edinburgh and Glasgow kind of way. Um, but actually, you know, that's clearly probably played into the huge success of the tourism and the distillery uh, itself. Um, you know, do you want to kind of maybe tell us a little bit about the, the, the tourists uh, who have been coming to Sky? actually? Have you, do you have any stories about that? I'd say, firstly, that it's amazing that you have tourists from all over the world that are able to make their way to Sky because um, the very first time I came here, like I said, it was the first time I'd actually visited Talisker as well. Um, and it's not a journey for the faint-hearted. Um, and as you said, it's what, four hours you're saying from Edinburgh and Glasgow takes me around five. Don't know how fast you drive. Uh, <laughs> but it is quite far away from anywhere. So I think that people make that pilgrimage to come visit us because they're so in love with the Talisker brand and they want to see what it's produced and see what it's made. And I think that's really special in itself. Um, in terms of specific stories, I don't know if I can think of anything off the top of my head, but um, it's just the people that show their like undying love and somebody's say uh, proposed here right in front of the distillery and asked for our help and contacted me through LinkedIn to help organize their uh, engagement party not engagement party but their um, engagement and um, it's things like that that people find it so special um, as a brand that they want to get engaged right in front of us um, I think that's incredible. Yeah it's pretty cool and um, I, I love the stories also of uh, the distillery causing you know tailbacks on the single track road into the distillery during the summer and the police actually stopping individuals before they get to Sky um, at the castle, essentially asking, do you have accommodation before you come onto Sky? Don't think about coming and day tripping here because the numbers just seem to be going through the roof each year. 
Um, yeah. And a note to all of the participants on the call as well. Um, you know, COVID aside, don't come to Talisker straight away. Uh, we don't want to cause more hassle for Diane and the team there, but I'm sure she'd love to welcome you, um, you know, when actually, um, you know, when, when it's safe to do so. Um, so let's, uh, you know, let's actually uh, pause for a minute there. And, and what I'll do is we'll, we'll delve into the whiskey, actually. Um, and, um, you know, as I said at the start, um, hopefully you're out there um, with a whiskey. We can't actually see you. So what we'd love you to do is drop me a note who you are, where you are, um, and tell me what you're drinking. Again, hopefully it's a Talisker. Um, don't worry if it's not. Um, but stick in the Q&A section um, where you are, what you're drinking, um, and I'll guide you through the first whiskey that Diane and I have picked. Now, um, as I always talk about most tastings, um, make sure you have a glass of water on hand. So if you don't have one, uh, dig in. And um, make sure you have uh, hopefully a pipette with some water if you need to add it to the whiskey. Don't worry if you don't have one, get yourself a teaspoon. Um, I love the story when doing uh, one of my first ever tastings when I put too much water in somebody's whiskey um, and they protested quite loudly. And I said, look, it, it's come from water. If you do put too much water in your whiskey, just put some more whiskey uh, back in. It's absolutely fine. Um, so the first whiskey uh, Diane and I have picked um, is the Talisker 15 year old. And I'll hold it up to the camera so you guys can have a look. Um, again, this was on the mailer. Um, it's a readily available cast strength whiskey from the 2019 um, special releases. Um, Diane, why do you love this whiskey? I think in general, it's the theme uh, to start with. So the whole of the special release launch for 2019 was based on Rare by Nature. Um, and I think it's key because it shows the special and varied surroundings of each of our distilleries because each of them are so different. So it's great that they picked an, an individual element of all of them. So the packaging for Talisker very much reflects the oyster beds because obviously oyster pairings with Sky, eh, so the Talisker are um, key, and I hope you've tried them because um, yeah, we're famous for them. Um, so I think that's for me is quite special. It's also that it's the first release of Talisker that's ever been done as a 15 year old. So it's nice to be able to celebrate something new and something different. Amazing. And you know, we're having a flurry of uh, questions uh, or comments coming in. So it's nice to kind of hear from, uh, or not necessarily see friendly faces, but hear from some. So we've got um, Woody, who's drinking Brucladi, 22 year old. Shame on you, sir. Uh, we've got Dennis uh, with the mighty Talisker, eight year old, an absolute beautiful Talisker. Um, and not to forget, you know, that's the age that Talisker was actually bottled at. Um, so actually, uh, we've got a few more um, uh, joining. Mike and George, who are drinking Sky and Storm um, and the Distillers Edition bottling. And somebody, ah, uh, Hugh, um, is on a St. Magdalene, 19-year-old uh, cash strength. Wonderful, wonderful whiskey. Um, I've got a, a couple of people saying, can I suggest a snack? Um, if you like Marmite, I'd go for a knickknacks. Um, you know, you want something to really bite through the Talisker. Um, you might not want something quite salty and maritime. Uh, so anything like that would be fantastic. Um, so the whiskey itself, um, clearly really maritime. Um, we've got a chap from Hong Kong. Ah, welcome from Gareth, who's drinking a Lagavulin 1991. Again, shame on you, sir. Get on the Talisker. Um, so... Before you try the whiskey, give it a look, um, give it a swirl around the glass, have a look for the legs. Um, if the legs are coating and thick, it just gives you a good idea as to what's gonna go on in your mouth. Uh, Diane and I presented this one actually in London uh, together. And uh, you know, I think that the resounding comments from the, most of the individuals was it, it was the whiskey of the day, which was great. Um, and actually, I think this is a perfect example of Talisker um, and they're kind of trademark red hot chili peppers. There are two comments that, I, that will always stick with me um, about Talisker, and it was my first ever experience of Talisker. And the person that was presenting it to me talked about it being the lava of the Kulin. So beautiful Kulin Mountains. Diane will be able to explain it far better than I. And she probably you know, runs up the Kulins all the time. But um, because Sky was uh, clearly a, a lava, um, a, a, a volcanic area, um, people talk about this red hot fiery liquid which came from the distillery in the early 1900s and actually I think it translates to modern day Talisker's now 
Um, we'll talk slightly about the uh, distillation technique in a bit. Um, but um, give it a smell. Give it a taste, wash it around your mouth, treat it like mouthwash. I always say that, front to back, get it into the middle of your palate. Enjoy, slanty. And then swallow it down. What are you getting, Diane? I think you get that um, unexpectedly really rich and sweet notes. And then you get that spicy notes that everyone knows about Tal, so they start to come through after, after that initial surge, you start to get the spicy notes coming through. Amazing, yeah. I often find as well that there aren't many whiskies out there that have that signature DNA all the way through their releases. And the three whiskies that we picked today, the 15, the Distillers Edition, and even the 41, that DNA is all the way through. And I, I find it quite fascinating. Um, shout out to my mother and father, clearly drinking Talisker 10, well-trained, wonderful Mike and Stu, good stuff in Cree. Um, and then welcome David from South Africa, who's on Lagavulin in 16. Um, we'll let you off for that one as well, so fantastic. Um, as I mentioned before, don't be afraid to add a bit of water. You know, this is, certainly if you have the 15-year-old in front of you, it's 57.3% ABV. It's cash strength Talisker. So it goes a long, long way. Um, and quite often people try and jump in too much into cast strength whiskey, make sure that you've got it on your palate, make sure you're washing it all the way around. It has a long spicy finish this whiskey, but it has a beautifully light drying style um, and it leaves that thread of smoke on the tongue. And you know, to David in South Africa, who's trying the Lagavulin 16, a completely different smoke. So Lagavulin 16, you'll get an oily, leathery, kind of bonfire style smoke. Um, this is definitely um, chilly and hot, um, but with a slight drying, uh, drying finish. So let's talk distillation. Um, and you know, I think Talisker is actually quite special. For the, the whiskey geeks on the call, um, 1928 was actually the stage when um, uh, Talisker stopped its triple distillation. Unique for a number of reasons. Most Scotch whiskey is two times distilled. Irish tends to be three times distilled, but not exclusively. Um, but really, you know, we need to kind of delve a little bit into how the whiskey is made to create that kind of red hot chili pepper style. Um, and the things that we would talk about would be its unique still makeup, which Diane gets to see every day, and she'll have some stories about that as well. Um, essentially, we have two wash and three spirit stills. Now, normally we would have the same amount of spirit stills for um, wash stills, so that is slightly different. Um, the malt is medium peated, um, and clearly, uh, again, uh, the whiskey enthusiast amongst us will, will clearly uh, know uh, that the, the peat and where the peat comes from actually has had quite a big impact on the style of the whiskey as well. Um, and actually, you know, Talisker was ravaged by fire a couple of times, actually. Um, but, you know, in the 1960s, it actually burnt down and then it coincided in 72 when the maltings actually shut. Um, so the maltings uh, didn't pull, um, they started to pull their, their malted barley from Glen Ord, which I believe, Diane, is still where you get it today. Yep, we still get it in there today. Good stuff. A um, couple of shout outs to a few more people. Uh, we have Pierre on Isla, who's saying hello. Um, and then we have David in Teddington, welcome, welcome. Um, and drinking a uh, Hepburn's Choice, a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old, and Charles, who's on the Lagavulin and 27-year-old. Lovely stuff. Welcome. Um, so it's this uh, distillation. Um, we talk about lots of reflux in the stills. So um, Talisker is very, very unique in the sense that it has very tall wash stills, um, and the liquid reverberates essentially and is redistilled continuously, um, removing kind of heavy elements um, but actually it amplifies the fruit, uh, which, which is certainly coming from uh, the fermentation process. So you have this beautiful, wonderful um, distillation process, which is quite complex, um, but it does create that peppery new make. And Diane, you're probably able to, to say, you know, does that peppery new make even come in? Uh, is it apparent in the new make straight off the still? Um, have you experienced trying that? 
could you tell um, the group a little bit about that as well? Um, yeah, it's been a while since I've tried the new make. Um, I think you can definitely get all the elements of Talisker in, in the new make though. That peppiness is definitely there. Um, yeah. Obviously it mellows out a lot over the, the maturation periods, but it's definitely prevalent in the, in the new make spirit. Amazing. And I think, you know, Talisker certainly uses sulfur really well, not necessarily, um, you know, a, a common um, and positive thing sometimes when you talk about something being sulfury, um, but the nature in which uh, the stills and their massive reflux just seems to smooth out that flavor, which just allows for amazing aging. And as we see uh, in a minute with the 41 year olds, um, you know, it, it really does help develop this amazing whiskey at the other end. So, Let's go on to um, whiskey number two. Diane, this is probably your favourite. Tell us why. So, yes, this is the Distillers Edition. I'll hold it up so you can see it. I'll cover this part, though, because I'll explain why in a minute. Um, so, for me, the Distillers Editions are a collectible series of whiskies. So, they're an annual release. And Talisker's expression is... Um, undergoes a secondary maturation period in casks which previously held Amoroso sherry. So Amoroso is full-bodied, it's powerful and it's heavy um, as a sherry, not unlike Talisker itself, and its strong nutty flavours really complement the flavours of Talisker. Also the reason why I covered it is because on the 2018, 19 and 20 releases my name's on that bottle. This is the 2017 release I've got, um, which is not my name. Uh, so shameless plug there. If you buy the 2018 to 2020, I'll be on it. <laughs> and, you know, equally a shameless plug for Diane, if you do make that, um, you know, special journey to the distillery and purchase said bottle, I'm sure she will even personally sign it for you if she is on site. So um, make sure that you get your pen ready, Diane, because I think that's an absolute amazing accolade to have your name on um, actually one of my favorite Taliskers um, as well. And, you know, uh, Diane touches on a really interesting point um, around um, essentially this being a range or a collection. Um, and, you know, I've always tried to focus individuals on the fact that um, these things are, are rare and they go back all the way back to the 80s and sometimes some of them go back to the 70s. So um, Talisker in particular, this one, 1986 is the first ever distillers edition. Um, if you look at the Lagavulin PX Pedro Jimenez sherry cask, that goes all the way back to 1979. Uh, they're batches as well, so they tend to take the parent um, age, age for a short period of time in that second maturation, as Diane said. And what you get is this wonderful whiskey with the DNA but then something else, different le levels of flavor on top of this. So um, let's give it a try, actually. Uh, cheers, everyone out there. Cheers. Um, this is uh, Talisker in HD for me. It's, um, it's amplified a little bit more on the sweet notes. It's like Christmas cake. And I know that doesn't necessarily translate all across the world, but raisins, figs, big fruits, Full-bodied, really clean. Give it a try, slanty. So here's a question for you, Diane, which actually isn't planned at all um, and hasn't probably been asked from you before. If it was up to you, um, what style would you make if you could take Talisker in any other different direction and, and create a release for yourself? Oh, that is a tough one. I've never been asked before. Well, I mean, it's hard because Talisker has got such a huge portfolio of whiskies already. Actually, probably most of the things that are you think of are already been done. Um, okay. But I do, not to avoid your question, but I do really enjoy things like um, Gautree and the Cellars edition where it's done in secondary maturation and you've got that additional element to it. So you've still got the flavours, but you also have that additional um, flavour profile coming through. So for me like you're saying Christmas cake for Distillers Edition, I get, I feel almost like it's breakfast in a glass. So you still get the same three elements that you talked about earlier that actually carry through all the portfolio. You get that surge of sweet, you get the uh, smoke coming through and you get the, um, that kind of, the signature uh, peppery spicy notes that Talos will give you. But in this release, uh, Distillers Edition, you get this, so I said breakfast in a glass, I get this surge of orange marmalade, like a burnt toast feel with the orange flavour um, and then that all over butter, buttery mouth feel. Um, so for me, it's 
it's delicious and if I was to recreate something it would be around additional um, maturation because I think you get a great flavour profile off the back of it. Yeah fantastic and we've got a couple of questions that are actually just coming in just now and um, one from the very famous um, global ambassador Mr Colin Dunn um, and his opinion says it tastes like liquid fruit cake dipped in chocolate and um, which I think is an amazing analogy um, and you know a couple more interesting questions I think uh, Gareth from Hong Kong and um, you know to Diane is there any difference in the distillation process between the distillers edition or the regular um, and happy for you to answer that or I can answer that up to you yeah no there's absolutely no difference um, how we make talus and numic spirit is the same across every single thing we do all the different flavors come from how we mature it perfect and you know just to kind of show on label for Gareth and anybody else that's interested so um, this is the uh, 2007 so this was distilled in 2007 um, and essentially bottled in late 2017 so it is the classic 10 year old um, that we would have from the distillery and the finishing time we don't tend to speak about it too much around the secondary maturation um, but you can just work out the math that it's between one month and 12 months um, that we uh, tend to finish these uh, distillers additions in those casks have a look out for some other key ones and um, you know like the Lagavulin which is PX uh, Pedro Jimenez uh, sherry cask finish which is an absolute delicious uh, whiskey again uh, dating back to 1979 for the earliest um, and then um, we also have beautiful ones from the likes of Kalila which is another one of my favorites Muscatel wine cast finish so um, got a key question from Sarah uh, should you keep or should you enjoy distillers editions um, I, I say the latter um, uh, if you are able to keep one and enjoy one, then that's fantastic as well. But for me, whiskey is about opening and sharing. Um, but, you know, have a look out for the previous iterations of these. Um, as I said, they, they date back many years and there are nuances and differences. And that, that's basically just to do with uh, the casks um, that we've purchased in as well. Um, and then a, a really interesting one from Jake. Um, should you add a cube of ice or not? Diane, what's your thoughts on this? You can have it however you want. So for me, I get asked this question a lot and I think that it dates back to when people used to say, oh, you can't put a drop of water in it or it's only one drop or you can't have any ice or you can't put a mixer in it. I think those times are massively changing and it's about how you want to enjoy your whiskey. So if you want water, add water. If you want ice, add ice. And if you want it in a highball or a cocktail, then have it like that. So it's definitely dependent on your personal choice. I, I totally agree, I see, and you know, I think that whiskey has now moved into that new democratized stage of enjoy it how you like. And um, the one thing I would say about ice is temperature does tend to affect flavor quite dramatically. And what you might want to just be aware of is if you lower the temperature, it sometimes can dull the taste. So there's that fine balance between dilution and warmth. Um, quite often when we, we do these tastings and we do um, many frequent tastings kind of on Zoom, um, and kind of across the world, we always ask individuals to pour out the whiskies beforehand, allowing them to settle, allowing them to breathe. So temperature can play, play a real big um, factor in that. Um, Alistair has just asked, how important is the location and influence of the sea air on the final drum? Good question. So you get asked this question a lot. Um, so what I'd say is it's where it's made, it's not where it's matured. So we're made by the sea, as it says in our name. You get those kind of that, that fine sea air that blows over and it makes its way into the distillation process. But actually in the maturation, it can, we've got uh, casks that are matured in the central belt, that are cured, matured all, all across Scotland, not just here. So it's about where it's made, not where it's matured. And I think that it's those flavours that start to make their way into the final product. Bang on. And, you know, I, I think also for me, it's quite interesting to ask that question because for me, Talisker is one of the strongest brands which takes you back to the distillery. So it's almost like the distillery style and flavor is mixed with what you see and what you experience when you're there. Um, so it, it is a, you know, a really interesting and valid, valid question. Um, Jules has just asked, how long have the current stills been in situ? So um, 1960 uh, was when they burnt down those current stills, um, actually, and they, they were replaced. Now, component parts of the stills will be replaced all the time, which Diane probably knows um, when the popular wears thin. Yeah. So the, 
there was one wash still, one spirit still replaced in February. Last year, the other wash still and spirit still, uh, sorry, the other two spirit cells were replaced last year and the previous year was the second wash still. So in the past three years, they've all been replaced. Great. Yeah, I think that analogy with the, with the broom, you know, lots of different uh, handles and lots of different heads, but um, component parts of the stills will be replaced all the time. And due to alcohol um, and abrasion on the copper stills, um, copper obviously wears very thin and then, then has to be replaced. Um, but the one thing that's consistent is the, the style, the shape. Um, you know, you don't want to put any extra dents in um, or change any directions of line arms and refluxes because actually it will dramatically affect the, uh, the flavors. So um, how's everybody doing out there? Drop us a question. Tell us uh, if you have any second whiskies or if there's any other questions for you. Um, I've added a small uh, smidge of water to the second uh, Talsker distiller's edition. Um, I get, um, uh, always I get dark chocolate with, uh, with this one. It's got that um, cocoa notes and a bit of vanilla, uh, which is coming through. Um, and actually, we'll, we'll talk about uh, wood and how critical it is actually in the, um, the last whiskey. Um, if I can move on to that. So um, I get quite a few questions um, about my job, about you know, what my most exciting thing is I do. Um, and I think it's uh, opening bottles like this. Um, I absolutely love opening bottles that are older than me. Um, and it's a bit of a personal thing, but I, um, I like to compare myself and how I'm doing versus the liquid in the bottle. And it, it might be a strange thing to do, but I kind of try and even peg it. So I was born in 82, clearly a fantastic time for first growth Bordeaux and uh, some other beautiful wines, um, but clearly a bad time for whiskey. So I try and even peg and find 82s out there that are either 38 or similar or whatever. Um, so this one's slightly older than me. It's uh, 1978, um, and you know I, I think this is a, an incredibly special bottle. At the time when it was released, this is the oldest uh, Talisker that we've we've released onto the marketplace. It's um, a cast strength uh, bottle, um, and it's part of the Bodega series. This is number two, um, and this is really here to celebrate the relationship between us and the oldest Bodega, uh, um, Delgado Zaleta. Um, and essentially the relationship that dates back to 1900s. So um, for me, you know, this is all about the wood. Um, this is about taking something which is quite old um, and what we hope is that it's not fragile, which it's definitely not. And we're enhancing the flavors um, by again, secondary finishing it in casks, which have been selected uh, from Delgado Zaleta. Um, in this particular kind of run, it's only 2000 bottles. Uh, they, they're, um, and I've opened one of them, which is fantastic, one less on the market. Um, and actually, we, we've used specific phenol sherry casks, um, so very dry sherry. Um, and actually, you know, as I said, this is the oldest producer from the Sherry Triangle. So it's a very, very historic moment that we celebrate, um, you know, dating back over 100 years with the relationship, uh, which is in our archives. So what do you think of this one, Diane? I think it's... Uh, well, I mean, it speaks for itself, it's incredible, and I think that we're able to um, pay homage to that old relationship between the Sherry Triangle and ourselves. I think it's really special. Um, what I get from this, so from the difference between, for me, between the 40-year-old, which re was released two years ago, and the 41-year-old, which was last year, I think that this one is a lot more smooth, it just seems much more well-rounded, it's got like the lovely, lovely sweet notes, I think it's just easy drinkable, and I think that, I mean, if I could say a favourite whiskey, I'd say 41 year old, but I think that's probably quite expensive taste that I, uh, I'll, I have there. So, um, but I think it's a delicious expression of Talisker and I think it's amazing. I think for, for me that, um, you know, fantastic of individuals are out there trying this one. I think for me is um, the vibrancy that you get from this whiskey. Um, you know, this, this is a 41 year old whiskey. Um, it still has incredible strength. It's, it's not controlled strength, so there's no added demineralized water off the still. It's, it's gone straight from the cask, uh, sorry, straight from the still, straight into the cask, straight into the last six um, uh, marrying finishing casks, and then straight to bottle at 50.7. Um, huge vibrancy. The, the DNA is, is still there. Um, it's amazing. It still has that red hot chili pepper, uh, distinctive kind of lava, um, hotness 
but it's very smooth. Um, and I think the, the phenol... Sorry, oh, you go, sorry. I think the sweetness of it is a different type of sweetness that you get to normal Talisker. So it's much more like a like a treacle than it is like a normal kind of caramel uh, sweet surge. So it's, it's much more intense. Um, and you get a lot of the kind of like dried fruit and raisins and figs and it comes a lot more powerful than you get in your standard Talisker. So it amplifies a lot that you get out of the, of the sherry, but also that you get out of Talisker. So I think it's a great pairing. Absolutely. And we've got some interesting questions actually from, uh, so from Dennis. Um, would unpeated Talisker taste like the Kalila unpeated in terms of revealing their distillery flavors? Now, that f for me, that's quite an interesting question. So um, for, for the individuals out there who are unfamiliar, is, is Kalila um, the, uh, the, the second distillery of ours on the Isle of Isla and produce a peated and an unpeated um, uh, variant? And we've done various age expressions, 15, 17, uh, from memory, I think in 18. So, you know, interestingly, without the smoke, there's that huge fruit driven flavors which come out. Now, Diane, you might need to take a stab in the dark as to what this would be like, I guess, without smoke. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, maybe, on how that might manifest itself? I mean, it's tough to say, but I'd, like, if you look at that, like I've talked about this whole time, the three-stage process you get with Talisker, you get that sweet, the initial real surge of sweetness, and then you get that smoke element, and then you get the spicy peppery notes. So if you were to take away the smoke, then I would imagine that you would get more of the sweetness amplified, you get more of those dried fruit notes, but that's just a stab in the dark. And I, I think you're bang on because I think that where Kalila is quite interesting is it's more citrus fruit. So it, it's quite lively on the palate without the unpeated, uh, in the unpeated expressions. And I do wonder if, you, if you're lucky enough to, to go back and look at some of the very old Taliskers, not necessarily in age, but when they were bottled in the 50s and the 40s, the style is, is very big fruit driven, very little smoke, very paired back. And um, so, you know, and, and there could be a number of factors, centralized maltings where they were doing their own floor maltings, creating different funky flavors. Um, we've got um, an anonymous person asking memorable food and Talisker pairings that, that, have, uh, that, that you've had before. So Diane, what's your favorite Talisker and food pairing? So I'll give you what it should be, and then I'll tell you what mine is. So <laughs> it should be um, based on everyone's um, admiration for Talisker oyster pairings. So you would get the, um, the oyster and you pour a little bit of Talisker, usually Talisker 10 into that um, and enjoy it that way. Um, I personally am the biggest Tal uh, Talisker oyster fan because I'm not the biggest oyster fan. Um, so although I will plug it because I know everyone else is, um, it's maybe not for me. Um, but what I've tried recently, and which is my new favourite cocktail with Talisker, is um, Talisker Sky, but as a poached pair old fashioned. So it's actually Jason Clark, the global uh, whiskey ambassador, that um, let me try that, and I made him give me the recipe. So it's on the World Class Facebook page for anyone that wants it. It's amazing. And I had it at the weekend actually with, it's called Zillionaire's Cheesecake, but any kind of cheesecake. It's got chocolate and salted car caramel in it um, with salted caramel ice cream. The three of those things just work incredibly together. Um, I do have a sweet tooth, but it's perfect. Sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, the only thing I'd add about the oysters is, you know, individuals are, they sometimes struggle with oysters, completely get it, texture, taste. Um, some of the best oysters I've tried with, uh, with Talisker have actually been on Sky, you know, where the oyster shack is literally two minutes up the road. Um, but actually, some of the best pairings I've ever seen or had um, have been uh, baked oysters. So um, essentially breadcrumbs, you can put in some blue cheese um, and essentially bake them for a period of time. So warm oysters, I know I can probably feel some people, um, you know, uh, through, the, through the computer screen going, oh my God, that sounds awful. Um, but actually, um, you know, I think it's an amazing, uh, um, you know, pairing. But I think strong fish is has always been certainly the direction we've ever taken Talisker in. Um, but it works with robust flavors because it, it really cuts through. So uh, think oily foods, you know, even uh, things like mackerel, um, you know, haggis, clapshot stack, beautiful, oily, um, um, and then even, you know, smoked salmon. Uh, don't don't uh, discount um, smoked salmon from, from a beautiful um, 
uh, fishery and you know and Talisker works beautifully beautifully well with that. Um, we have Hugh who's on the Kalila 12 year old wonderful dram uh, cash strength beautiful whiskey very similar to the 15 year old almost like the Isla version of that um, and then a quick note from my mum who's on her second dram um, expect trouble which is clearly my dad that's been saying that so that that's absolutely fantastic and um, so um, taking it slightly away from from um, uh, Talisker for a second what's been your best day in lockdown um, so one immediately springs to mind so me and my partner and um, so I never thought I'd be stuck on sky without leaving once in uh, nine weeks so you have to become a bit more inventive of things to do so we um this is actually his idea to create an obstacle course in the garden um some of the things included uh, we have got a darts board so um try and pop a balloon on the darts board was the first part which i spent far too long at um and then another element of it was he'd soaked the downhill part of our garden with the hose and with fairy liquid so I had to go inside a black bin bag and jump down which immediately you went um, so it was just good fun and I think I've probably not laughed that hard in years so um, yeah I think sometimes being stuck in isolation you come up with crazy fun ideas and that was one of them. Great um, and after lockdown what's the first thing you're going to do? Definitely see my family. Um, yeah. My family are in Glasgow so mum and dad live down there um, so I cannot wait to see them and my brother's out in Australia at the moment um, for some time and he was supposed to be home and kind of April May time so not sure when I'll see him but again I can't wait to see him so definitely see family. And when um, when it's safe to do so and flocks of people arrive on the um, Talisker doorstep what, what's the kind of three best things to do on Sky? So number one come visit us at Talisker obviously. Absolutely uh, um, but book, book first. Book first, definitely. And I think that we'll have to wait and see what post uh, lockdown looks like um, in terms of how we can manage people here, but um, we'll make it work um, and come visit our lovely bar here. <laughs> um, number two, I would say most of the stuff outdoors in Sky and um, hopefully you get a nice day. It's not always possible, but if you do, um, then there's some incredible walks. So one of them I would say would be the Old Man of Store on East Point, it's kind of in between those two. Um, incredible views, um, like beautiful scenery and landscape. So um, definitely uh, one of those, but I would recommend some walking boots, seeing as the first time me and some friends went up to the Old Man of Store, I wore my bright pink uh, night trainers, um, which didn't really <laughs> last. So definitely had to buy myself some walking boots. Um, and the third, I would say, everyone's going to want to visit the fairy pools. Um, and We've been far more times than I can imagine, uh, than you can imagine, sorry, because of the amount of people that want to see it. Um, I think it's just a really pretty place to go and visit, and especially if you've got kids coming with you. So we took my partner's niece up there, um, and she was only three at the time, and um, very much still believes in fairies. So that was nice to try and help her spot out the fairies where at the fairy pools. So yeah, most of it's outdoors, so definitely come visit us here. Good. Um, we've had a couple of questions just come in, actually. Um... A uh, question from John, how would you enjoy Talisker in the summer? And this probably links into maybe something that we've both experienced in Asia. Definitely. Uh, I know you, what you're going to say is the highballs. So um, the highballs kind of taking the world by storm. Um, I think Talisker is something, or any whiskey is something you can enjoy year round responsibly. Um, but what I'd say is that the highball is a much more refreshing way to have it. So in a highball glass, um, ice, uh, your talisker and soda uh, or you can have the ginger ale uh, and crushed lime um, but if you're having it with soda something that I had when I was out in Tokyo uh, with talisker is we had cracked black pepper on top of the um, on top of the highball and they're famous for it anywhere you go in uh, Tokyo I seem, to, I seem to find it there so um, yeah the highball is definitely a much more refreshing way to enjoy it. Yeah absolutely so I mean just at absolute massive advocate of um you know the whiskey highball um really to democratize whiskey as much as possible and um, you don't need to drink all types of whiskey in glasses like this and um, you know straight up at room temperature so um you know for anybody who's interested in highballs 
um, you know, reach out. It's, it's very simple. Just think of it as a, especially something with Talisker, Talisker Sky, ice soda, maybe even a, a small wedge of lemon. Um, it's essentially just like a smoky gin and tonic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we have a couple of comments from Pierrick, who probably doesn't need any uh, introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. So he um, he is Diane's equivalent at uh, the mighty Kalila on Isla, um, but he has experience on Sky as well. So he's uh, he's worked at Talisker before. Um, he's giving a good shout out to Hugh, saying uh, that you have very good taste, sir, with your Kalila 12 year old. Um, and you know, in terms of the Kalila Talisker discussion we were having earlier on. Um, you know, he absolutely agrees. Kalila, more citrus, green grassy style. Talisker is a bit richer, heavier, and, and it's the mix of reflux worm tubs, as we discussed. Um, and, uh, you know, we just have a, a, a quick question from somebody. What's your favorite, uh, let's ask it like this, what's your desert island Talisker expression? If you could only drink one uh, Talisker expression for the rest of your life, what would it be? This is where it's tough because I've mentioned that Talisker poached pear old fashioned, which is uh, very Moorish. Um, but I'll always come back to Talisker 18 year old. I think it's got the same flavours as the 10 year old that I've touched on multiple times in this call, but it's more mature, clearly. Um, it's more sweet, there's that le less smoke and chilli, but it's just really well rounded and well balanced. And I think it's an incredible expression. Amazing. Yep. Um, totally agree. One of my all time favorite Talisker's, even at cash strength or the new controlled strength variant is absolutely beautiful whiskey. Um, so we're almost um, reaching the uh, kind of wrap up period. So if anybody does have any final questions, please uh, reach out. Oh, here we go. Uh, what are you drinking when you're not drinking Talisker? Good question. Well, it could either be cocktails or it could be gin and tonic. Usually a gin and tonic. Um, or cocktails, it's quite like a margarita. Okay, good. Um, any more questions from anybody else? Just waiting on a few coming in. I think we're okay. So as I previously, previously mentioned, um, the three whiskies that we, we've taken you through um, is the Talisker 15-year-old, uh, part of the 2019 special releases, um, the Talisker Distillers Edition. Uh, the one that we tried was the 2007 bottled in 2017, um, and the Talisker 41-year-old, um, the second part of the Bodega series um, from the mighty Talisker Distillery, um, and uh, casks from uh, the oldest um, uh, um, Hareth Triangle Bodega. Um, all still available. Um, please have a look out for the mailers and, and online. Um, I'll leave you with an interesting uh, Talisker story. Um, the first time I tried Talisker, um, it was probably the worst whiskey experience anyone could actually have. Um, I was given a glass uh, with three fingers of Talisker in the glass. Um, uh, this beautifully warm, but beautifully outside cold um, and told to drink up. And I drank up and I didn't like it it burnt and it hurt. Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, I think the lesson of the story is to approach these things softly, um, try what you like, try what you don't like, um, add a touch of water if you need to. If you add too much water, clearly go back and add some whiskey, it's no problem. Um, and it's okay if you don't like something for the first time, there is a whiskey out there for you. Um, please reach out if you have any questions. Um, and, uh, you know, I know that Diane will be looking forward to post-COVID when it's safe to host you all at the distillery. Um, thank you so much for uh, joining with us. Um, oh, I've got a last one. Um, somebody's recommending Talisker with Coston Press, um, actually, um, which is rhubarb, um, I think rhubarb and cucumber uh, soda uh, in a highball is absolutely delicious. And I completely agree. And it works very, very well. Uh, with Kalila as well, because I've tried that as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh